this topic blood supply of pura matter okay okay so you know dura matter it is the outer the thickest layer of the meninges it's also called you know you know th these are different you know according to the thickness pachy meninges is the thickest this one is pachy meninges the dura and lepto meninges include arachnoid and pia matter pachy means thick right so this dura matter has two layers the outer layer and inner, inner layer the outer layer you know is more vascular right that lines the inside of the cranial vault as well as the in, entire cranium then the inner layer the meningeal layer that is more fibrous and that so just to make it more rigid right so that's more fibrous and that makes the folds of the dura matter so they you find you have to just focus upon the arterial supply of dura matter in this chapter in this lecture so you know you seeing this is the inside of the cranial vault inside of the cranial vault when you see you will find that there are sutures this is the coronal suture between you know parieto frontal bone frontal parietal suture this is a sagittal suture or interparietal suture this is the lambdoid or parieto occipital suture right then then you see in this point is bragma there is this lambda then all of it is lined from inside by the endosteal layer the outer layer of the dura as well as the inner layer the meninges both are fused actually but at places they get separated to create spaces to form dural venous sinuses and one of the sinuses you see here that the sagittal suture on inside has the sulcus and that's called sagittal sulcus and to the margins of this there is the folding you can see this and this this is the folding of the meningeal layer or the dura on itself to form fox cerebri that you know dips between the two cerebral hemispheres okay in the mean and longitudinal fissure then you can find there are these lacunae these are you know these are grooves you know formed into the inner table of the cranial vault because of the you know pedunculated tufts of arachnoid matter called arachnoid granulations it's called granular fovea the as the age progresses these become more prominent these pits okay and as the age progresses as the age advances as i told you earlier also that these sutures start fusing firstly on the inner table Uh, in the around third decade of life and later on on the outer table from outside around the fourth decade of life and this fusion is called synostosis then you find parietal foramina here also you know these parietal foramina on the two sides these are basically for the passage of the imagery veins and then there also you find these uh, you know irregular streaks like you know irregular branching pattern of the meningeal vessels they have an impression on the inner table and these impressions because of meningeal vessels mainly because of the meningeal veins because veins are more in proximation to the inner table then arterial supply of dura mater is you know the dura lining the cranial fold wall from inside right or covering the you know superior aspect of the brain that portion of the dura is perfused by the middle meningeal artery clear rakhna ekdam easy right the entire dura covering the brain from above or from uh, inside of the cranial vault that is being perfused by middle meningeal artery okay and middle meningeal artery is a branch of first part of maxillary artery okay then this you this figure you've seeing is the inside of the cranium or the calvaria which is naturally which has natural subdivisions into three parts this and this you know in between is a butterfly shape it this is the middle cranial fossa so middle cranial and the anterior cranial fossa they are separated by this laterally by this lesser wing of the sphenoid and and in the middle 
it is by tuberculum cilae, right? This tuberculum cilae and the anterior margin of the sulcus chiasmaticus. And posteriorly, you know, middle cranial fossa and posterior cranial fossa, they are separated by these, you know, superior part of the petrous temporal bone and the dorsal cilae, right? This is the body of sphenoid and this has the dorsum cilae and anterior is a tuberculum cilae. Onto these two margins, there is diaphragma cilae attached. So you've seen that these are the natural subdivisions. Now talking about the dura lining the floor of the cranial cavity. So, you know, this posterior cavity, this posterior cranial fossa is actually subdivided by tentorium cerebelli which is a horizontal tent-shaped fold of dura into an infratentorial fossa, which lodges the hindbrain and the lower portion of the midbrain. And above to that will be the occipital lobes of the cerebrum. Now, this anterior cranial fossa, the dura here, right? The dura here lining, you know, covering this. First of all, let me tell you, like, if you could open the cranial wall, this meninges, the, you know, outer layer can be easily separated out, right? So that space is epidural or extradural space, right? So it's not so tightly attached, like, you know, periosteum of other bones is not separable. But here, this endosteal layer of the dura, when you remove the cranial wall, you'll find it easily separable. But although not on the floor, in the floor of the cranial cavity, the dura is not easily separable. Then, yeah, regarding blood supply, this floor of the anterior cranial fossa, the blood supply is by the three arteries. You have anterior tomoidal artery, posterior tomoidal artery, and ophthalmic artery. All of them are branches, you know, this is all supplied by branches of, you know, internal carotid and from internal carotid you have ophthalmic and from ophthalmic artery the main trunk you have these two branches as well. So remember this floor of the anterior fossa is mainly supplied by these three branches, meningeal branches of course from the ophthalmic artery, anterior and posterior tomoidal artery. We'll discuss about these branches later on. Just you know in this you know slide you just try to learn the blood supply at least the names of the vessels supplying the dura on the floor of the cranial cavity then in the middle cranial fossa you have this dura mantle lining here and the blood supply of the middle cranial fossa you know is you know the vessels found here will be those vessels will be providing meningeal branches to the dura of the middle cranial fossa and these vessels are middle meningeal artery as you know middle meningeal artery it enters from the middle cranial fossa right through the foramen spinos then accessory meningeal artery that enters through foramen ovale then internal carotid artery it is also found here it in fact actually enters through foramen lacerum here in the middle cranial fossa and it also is a content of cavernous sinus on the two sides of this letter shika and then it comes to lie you know on the floor of the brain and in the form of you know it's cerebral portion of the internal carotid artery and of course uh, there are you know branches coming from outside of the skull and this one of them is this ascending pharyngeal artery which gives its meningeal branches uh, actually three meningeal branches uh, from ascending pharyngeal artery into the cranium and one of them enters to foramen lacerum and the middle cranial fossa. So remember the blood supply of the dura lining the middle cranial fossa is by four arteries, middle meningeal artery, essence, uh, you know, accessory meningeal artery. Both of them are branches of maxillary artery, first part. And internal carotid artery, as well as ascending pharyngeal, which is a branch of external carotid artery. Okay. Now, you seeing this is the posterior cranial fossa and it has uh, the largest foramen, the true foramen of the occipital bone and through which the CNS, right, CNS produced in the form of spinal cord into the vertebral canal. Then this surface here, the inside of the cranial, posterior cranial fossa is lined by dura and the blood supply to this dura is by the three arteries. <coughs> 
Vertebral artery, of course, you know that enters the foramen magnum, then occipital and ascending pharyngeal. Now, these are the branches from external carotid, but they give them meningeal branches which enter into the skull. So, occipital artery and ascending pharyngeal artery, they both give them meningeal branches which enter into the posterior cranial fossa through the jugular foramen. Ascending from the meningeal branch from ascending pharyngeal enters into the anterior portion of the jugular foramen, and the meningeal branch of occipital artery enters into the posterior cranial fossa through the posterior end of the jugular foramen. Then ascending pharyngeal also gives another meningeal branch, right? There are two condyles if you see on the floor, you know, norma basalis, right? On the outside of this, you find there are occipital condyles and anterior and posterior to the condyles, there are anterior and posterior condylar canals. So to the anterior condyle canal, that's also called hypoglossal canal, through that, you know, as a uh, meningeal branch of ascending pharyngeal artery enters into the cranium. So, you know, ascending pharyngeal artery is giving three meningeal branches, one enters through foramen lacerum, one through the foramen jugular foramen, and one through the anterior condylar canal. So, <clears throat> There you know now the blood supply of the calvaria or the cranium on the ins in the medulla lining the inside of the cranium. The anterior fossa by three arteries, middle one by the four arteries, you know them, and the posterior fossa by these three arteries. Okay, if you've learned it, we'll move it now to the next slide. Now talking about those branches which we supply, you should have some idea about from where these branches are entering into the cranium so we were talking about the branch meningeal branches like the anterior cranial fossa and remember there were three branches of thalamic artery and then anterior and posterior ethmoidal artery so look here now this you're seeing is the internal carotid yeah internal carotid the cerebral part right which is found in the floor of the uh, floor of the brain in the middle cranial fossa from there it gives this ophthalmic artery right ophthalmic artery is a branch of cerebral portion of internal carotid now ophthalmic artery along with the optic nerve enters into the orbits right to supply all the you know structures within the orbit then in the orbit like you know this gives us lacrimal like branch this is the main trunk right before like you know it also gives its like a branch to the uh, central artery of retina right you know there was dural sheath or peri you know i told you like you know the three sensory nerves you know first second and the eighth cranial now they have this uh, the meninges uh, you know prolonged to enclose these nerves within the cranial within the course of the cranial intracranial course and those are called perineural sheaths so this subarachnoid space also extends along to these sensory nerves to a certain extent so the central artery of retina runs within this perineural sheath and then you know embedded in itself into the uh, content or tissue of the optic nerve and that's how it enters into the eyeball that central artery of retina remember sciatic nerve that was having the same thing sciatic nerve also it was the it's the largest nerve in the human body which is around two centimeter right well it emerges into the gluteal, gluteal region and there uh, you know there was this axial artery and that was also called the axial artery of the lower limb and that was artery to sciatic nerve branch from inferior gluteal artery okay that also runs within the substance of sciatic nerve similarly is this here the central artery of retina runs within the uh, optic nerve for a short distance before it enters into the eyeball okay now the main trunk you know ha huh, this lacrimal branch look here this is lacrimal branch right which moves on laterally in the orbit then this branch gives a you know recurrent meningeal branch right so one of the branches from the op op ophthalmic artery is recurrent meningeal branch it you know as the name suggests recurrent means it has a you know direction opposite to the course of the main trunk so it moves back through the uh, lateral portion of the superior vital fissure and from there it reaches back into the middle cranial fossa with where it anastomosis with the middle meningeal artery. So one of the arteries, meningeal branches from ophthalmic artery is this recurrent meningeal branch. And then from the main trunk on which runs the medial side in the orbit, it gives two branches. These are anterior and posterior ethmoidal arteries, which, you know, uh, pass through the foramina in the medial wall of the orbit. And 
there was a ethmoidal anterior posterior ethmoidal foramina through these these vessels enter into you know the roof of the nose right and that you find there is the ethmoid bone with the ethmoidal air sinuses so the prime purpose of these vessels is to perfuse the you know supply blood to the ethmoidal air sinuses right from there it ascends up and you know you've just seen the inside of the cranial cavity in the floor and the anterior cranial fossa in the mid in the medial pain you find is a small elevation there's a crista galli and on the other side at the side you find is cribriform palate and that's all a portion of ethmoid right so that's why ethmoid is an you know unpaired bone one of the unpaired bone forming calvaria so that is how this ethmo you know it ascends and reaches into the cranial cavity and there it supplies the dura on the floor of the anterior cranial fossa then after that even that in anterior ethmoidal artery then again dip back into the cribriform palate anteriorly and enters into the nose to supply the interior of the nose as well so that was about these vessels so see the supply you've seen remember and the cranial fossa the blood supply is by ethmoidal you know this anterior and posterior ethmoidal vessels the supply ethmoidal air sinuses the supply the floor of the anterior cranial fossa and its dura and the upper part of nose got it so that was about the blood supply of anterior now we're focusing upon the blood supply of the middle cranial fossa Middle cranial fossa, as I told you, is a butterfly-shaped fossa. <coughs> Here you seeing is the uh, you know lateral portion of the middle cranial fossa, and this is the body of the sphenoid having a depression, the hypo you know hypophyseal fossa. And lateral to that, it, this you know dotted line they shown is the outline of the cavernous sinus. Then <coughs> this is the petrous temporal bone, and here you find is the squamous portion of the temporal bone and they find is the greater wing of the sphenoid right so you all you know these are the bones forming the floor of the middle cranial fossa there is this you know the greater wing the sphenoid this you find is the posterior end and at this end is a small minus process which is for you know protruding uh, out right you know you see the norma basalis the floor of the skull from outside there you find is a spinous process right arising from here this is the posterior lateral end of the greater wing of the sphenoid and that's called you know spine of sphenoid right and to the and to the spine of sphenoid there's a ligament attached which reaches to the lingula of the mandible and that's how it's called sphenomandibular ligament who will tell me that sphenomandibular ligament develops from which branchial arch no 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 yes imran mora is first so it develops from the first branchial arch now look here so at the same point sphenomandibular uh, you know that spinous sphenoid just means that there is a foramen this is called foramen spinosum right so through this foramen spinosum right through this foramen spinosum this artery enters into the cranium and this is a branch of first part of axillary artery and the artery is middle meningeal artery clear so when it enters into the cranium it soon divides into its anterior and posterior divisions right so remember the anterior division is one which runs towards the temple right to the terion if you remember the h shaped suture present late you know on the two sides of the temple right temple is the you know portion of the skull above an anterior to this zygomatic arch and there is to find is terion the h shaped suture so we need to that you find is the anterior division of the middle meningeal artery and you know that this artery because this portion of the skull is very vulnerable to head injuries because of the thin squamous bones here so this artery is very vulnerable for extradural hemorrhages remember in case of extradural hemorrhages the most common artery that to undergo laceration uh and to bleed is this middle anterior division of the middle meningeal artery then you find here is the posterior division of the middle meningeal this will be running you know uh, anteriorly upwards right uh, 
towards this carry-on, right? And this one is the posterior division. This will ascend along the superior temporal line, right? Superior temporal line, although you find on the outer surface, but that the same force you find in the posterior division of the middle laryngeal artery, which runs on the superior temporal line and reaches back towards the posterior inferior angle of the parietal bone. And that point forms uh, another fontanelle in the infant, and that's called posterior lateral fontanel or the you know mastoid fontanel that fuses around one year of life and then it is called asterion the point is called asterion where the mastoid occipital and parietal bones meet that is asterion so up till that you know there is this artery continues through the superior temporal line right so in case of extradural hemorrhages somebody was asking Yes, Akash, you remember? You asked me something relevant to this. So, you know, you have to actually drill a hole like to evacuate that, you know, clot from the extradural hemorrhage. Because if it stays there, extradural hemorrhages, it will cause compression effect, like, you know, compression to the underlying structures. So, it has to be, you know, sucked out. So, for that, a drill, a hole can be drilled out here, you know, for the uh, extradural hematoma formed because of you know anterior meningeal artery perfusion that you can you know in the you can say like four centimeters above the midpoint of the zygomatic arch right there you can drill a hole to suck out the clotted blood similarly in case of this here here uh, this uh, in case of rupture of this vessel the extra dural hematoma the clot form that can be sucked or evacuated by drilling a hole around four centimeter above and late above and posterior to the external auditory meatus so there you can bring out the clotted blood from the extra dural space so that was about the middle meningeal artery can you tell me now what are the other structures which you know traverse right enter or leave the middle cranial fossa through this foramen spinosum one you know is middle meningeal artery and the other things yadavi am i audible yes abdul i told you laceration of artery koi bhi laceration mein tearing off like you know not without a clear cut margin that's called laceration or hemorrhage is the better word Yes, nervous spinosis, right? Nervous spinosis. Spinosis say kabi naam usually because there is spinous phenoid, right? So for a minute spinosum be easy than is a name. So another thing that enters here is nervous spinosis, and that's a meningeal branch from the V3 division. When the mandibular nerve gives this main trunk of the mandibular nerve gives this meningeal branch. That I'll discuss with the nerve supply of the dura. So that enters into the cranial cavity through this, and that's called nervous spinosis. It's meningeal branch of mandibular nerve. What else? I told you. Remember, there was this anterior trunk of middle meningeal vein. Yes, yes, Shruti. So middle men anterior trunk of middle meningeal vein also enters through this. Okay, but sometimes, not always. Okay. Now you'll find this was one artery, then another artery, you know, the blood supply to this middle cranial fossa is by accessory meningeal artery. Now let's talk about accessory meningeal artery. Now accessory meningeal artery is also a branch from the first part of the maxillary artery and then enters to the enters to the middle cranial fossa through foramen oval, right? Yes, oval. Now oval may, you know, you must be knowing the mnemonic, right? The structure, this is foramen oval, anteromedial to this from its spinosum through this the structures passing is MALE. Now M is for mandibular nerve, which emerges out through this. And you can see the dotted line that is the motor division of trigeminal nerve, right? M for motor, M for medial, right? So motor nerve always is medial. Like even in case of facial, even in case of trigeminal, motor division lies medially. Anyway, so that motor division trigeminal runs along and even rather merges with the main trunk of the mandibular nerve. Though both of them they pass through this from an oval. One is mandibular nerve, A for accessory, right? Accessory meningeal artery is next. M A L 
एल इज लेसर पेट्रोसल नाउ रिमेम्बर लेसर पेट्रोसल नाउ बहुत जल्दी समझ में आ गया होगा दैट इज लाइक पी गैंगलोनिक पैरासिथरिक फाइबर्स फ्रॉम द इंफेसलाइवेटरी न्यूक्लियस रीचिंग टू द ओटी गैंगलियन वेरी गुड एम ए एल ई ई फॉर इमिशरी वेन्स राइट इमिशरी वेन्स हियर बिकॉज़ इज कैवर्नस साइनस सो इमिशरी वेन्स हु विल बी कनेक्टिंग लाइक यू नो कैवर्नस साइनस आउट टू द टेरिगोइड वेनस फ्लेक्शस very good so that was the mele pattern and sometimes again sometimes again you will find the another structures the fifth structure that is the posterior division of the middle meningeal vein very good shatriwari so these are the you know five structures that emerge from uh, you know they traverse the foramen oval right then uh, anteriorly in this fossa is this foramen rotundum and through foramen rotundum is the v2 division you know it's maxillary now which emerges out we not talking about that right now <clears throat> ma then aha uh -huh, the other artery supplying blood to the middle cranial fossa uh, is the meningeal branches from internal carotid artery right internal carotid artery will be taught to you in detail i think that must have already been taught to you but i if i'll get time i'll continue with that so this cavernous portion here you seeing that this also is providing you know meningeal branches right so meningeal branches are given from internal carotid also of course it is here uh in medial uh, in relation to the medial the cavernous sinus along with which nerve can anybody tell me which nerve lies in medial in relation to the medial wall of the cavernous sinus along with the internal carotid artery and the nerve is abducens nerve or abducens ke position kya thi relation in internal carotid se ye bhi pucha gaya hai in pro lateral very good in pro lateral infro lateral is exactly you know the relation of abducens nerve to internal carotid into the cavernous sinus okay so internal carotid is one you've got three then the fourth one the blood supply of this milkin fossa is by the you know meningeal branches from the ascending pharyngeal artery and ascending pharyngeal artery is you know blood supply to the uh facial region right so uh, pharyngeal branch so yes in pharyngeal it descends to the pharynx like in you know you know you've been taught about you know the pharynx or the you know facial skeleton everything from outside to the skull if you see in the base there's a pharyngeal tubercle remember on the basi occiput if you see the skull the normal basalis on the basi occiput in the center there is a bony prominence at the point called pharyngeal tubercle and that is the highest point of the pharynx up to which you know the superior constrictor and the you know the median raphe connecting the superior constrictor that reaches to this basi uh, pharyngeal tubercle and the you know pharyngo basilar fascia also reaches to that point so that means i'm telling you that this artery ascending meningeal artery ascends up to the base of the skull and there it gives its meningeal branches so one of the branches from ascending pharyngeal enters into the cranium through this uh, foramen lacerum right okay so you got to know about the four branches supplying the blood to the middle cranial fossa now foramen lacerum let's study it here because you know this lecture i have also like i'm covering different topics and this will also help you for your viva voci purpose uh, because skull is also always there and you've been asked to you know point out the different foramen and the structures passing and all and also for your mcq purposes for different exams <coughs> talking about look here now uh, this is foramen lacerum right so for foramen lacerum you know first of all it's not a true foramen right true foramen is a foramen which is which like margins are within the single bone right all it completely is surrounded by a single bone is a true foramen but here it is formed a gap formed between the you know when approximation of two or three different bones and there's a gap created and that's called a false foramen another false foramen in the cranium is jugular foramen 
so this also is a false foramen we sign postero literally is this petrous temporal bone and medial is the body of the sphenoid here and until you see also is this greater wing of the sphenoid and the pterygoid process of the uh, sphenoid right so anteriorly you seeing is a pterygoid process this is a pterygoid process and posteriorly it's the petrous portion of the temporal bone right the apex of petrous temporal which is reaching towards the body of sphenoid right and you can say just to the floor of the cavernous sinus then let me tell you that in life in life it is not completely like hulawa open thing it is closed it is closed by a cartilage right so the cartilage fills the lower end of the foramen lacerum in life okay one thing then uh, you know internal carotid internal carotid artery it enters you know into into the cranium through the carotid canal into the floor of the petrous temporal so the first part like you know of course the first part is the cervical part then in the cranium this is second part is the petrous part right this is the petrous part then it ascends up and reaches into the cavernous sinus this is the third or the cavernous portion and it and continues as the cerebral part which is the fourth part of the internal carotid artery now you see that this uh, you know this has a, you know a sigmoid or s shaped course carotid siphon banata hai ye sab detail aage kabhi padhai jayegi <clears throat> we are you seeing this carotid internal carotid is surrounded by sympathetic nerve plexus around it right you find is internal carotid artery and the sympathetic nerve plexus surrounding it and of course also you will find is venous plexus also there is also a venous plexus surrounding the internal carotid okay so if you you know uh, you know sometimes they ask like contents of carotid sheath right the so carotid sheath may when you talk about you know internal jugular internal you know common carotid internal carotid vagus right these are mainly the structures and of course the deep uh, cervical lymph nodes but <clears throat> in the highest portion of this uh, carotid sheath you will find 9th 11th and 12th nerve also because you know sub jugular foramen se nikal rahi hai and jugular foramen mein internal jugular reaches up to jugular foramen so that mean carotid sheath reaches to the jugular foramen so that upper part of the carotid sheath you will find 9th 11th 12th cranial nerves of course to, uh, 10th to is in, in the entire length right but 9th 11th and 12th are also there So you cannot rule out as the content of carotid sheath. Ninth and eleventh, twelfth, all the nerves are there, but ninth, eleventh, and twelfth they are only in the upper portion of the carotid sheath. But you know, there was a question. Remember, Simran, there was a question regarding this carotid sheath. So, sympathetic chain, no doubt, is lying outside to the cavernous carotid sheath posteriorly. right but you you been known that all the sympathetic fibers reaching to the cranium they either enter through this surrounding the internal carotid right here you seeing in this diagram sympathetic plexus enters into the cranium through the climbing up to the tunica adventitia of this internal carotid and of course there are the sympathetic plexus around middle meningeal arteries so you cannot rule out that sympathetic plexus is not a content of carotid sheath it also is a content of carotid sheath but not the sympathetic chain sympathetic plexus of course will sound the internal carotid similarly uh, this is the then ansa cervicalis ansa cervicalis the roots they are embedded into the anterior wall of the carotid sheath take so कैरोटिड शीत के कंटेंट से ध्यान दिल रहना इस पे क्वेश्चन आ चुके हैं और आते भी हैं तो एंड यू नो एंसर सर्वाइकल इज नॉट अ पार्ट ऑफ कंटेंट ऑफ इट राधा इट इज एम्बेडेड इन टू दीरियर वॉल ऑफ दैरोटिड शीत एंड सिंपेथेटिक चेन इज एक्चुअली प्लास्टर्ड यू कैन से रेस्टिंग ऑन द प्री वर्टिबल फाश आउटसाइड द कैरोटिड शीत but uh, contents may when you we'll talk sympathetic plexus is a content of carotid sheath one more thing is 
that the vagosympathetic trunk if you remember vagosympathetic trunk also is a content of carotid sheath and um, on the left side on the left side thoracic duct in the lower portion lower portion also becomes a content of carotid sheath okay kyunki if you remember ye drain kahan hota hai thoracic duct jahan internal jugular subclavian jod raha hai right aur internal jugular ko cover kon kar raha hai carotid sheath simple hai to lower portion mein on the left side thoracic duct also becomes a content of carotid sheath so ye carotid sheath ke bare mein sab dhyan se rakhna jo major structures hain wo normally pata hi rehte hain jo जो छोटे छोटे से यू नो पोर्शन को ट्रिवर्स करते हैं सम यू नो दी स्ट्रक्चर्स व्हिच आर इन कॉन्स्पिक्यूस लाइक यू नो वी नॉट वेरी मच टॉट इन योर टेक्स्ट सो क्वेश्चंस और नॉर्मली जो आते हैं सम टाइम्स दे आर ऑन द लेसर नोन फैक्ट्स सो इसलिए आई वाज जस्ट रिमाइंडिंग अबाउट द कैरोटिड शीट ये सिंपैथेटिक chain if they were the use if they use the word chain sympathetic chain then of course sympathetic chain is not a content of carotid that lies outside posteriorly and it is resting or plastered to the prevertebral portion agar chain word use kiya agar chain word use nahi kiya sympathetic fibers to of course sympathetic fibers also are the content of carotid sheath because they you can see it they run on to the wall of the internal carotid artery okay so that was just revision because literally i have like met across a question so i just wanted to revise it with you now look here then uh, other structures passing the foramen lacerum is you know this uh, greater petrosal nerve greater petrosal you know there are four petrosal nerves petrosal nerve i told you jo bhi petrous temporal bone se then uh, if there is a name related petrosal nerve that means they are somehow related to the petrous temporal bone so from within the petrous temporal bone this remember is the first intracranial branch of facial nerve that's greater petrosal nerve right arising from the geniculate ganglion of the facial nerve so greater petrosal nerve enters in the middle cranial fossa through this hiatus here on the uh, petrous temporal bone and then it descends down medially towards the foramen lacerum right and towards when it reaches the foramen lacerum this sympathetic plexus on the internal carotid artery also gives a branch right and that branch is called the deep petrosal nerve so the deep petrosal nerve is a sympathetic nerve arising from the sympathetic plexus on the inner carotid artery and greater petrosal is carrying you know two types of sensations one is like you know the parasympathetic sensations carry actually uh, you know secretory motor fibers for the you know greater petrosal nerve so it carries fibers for the uh, pterygopalatine and you know so all these salivary glands like some mandibular आगे आई टेल यू इधर की तरफ जो ग्रेट पेट्रोसल में इज बेसिकली फॉर द लेक्राइमल ग्लैंड एंड द म्यूकोसल ग्लैंड्स ऑफ द नेक नोज पैलेट फेरिंग्स एंड ऑल एंड दिस एक्चुअली रीचिंग टू द टेरिगोप्लेटिंग फोर्स नाउ लुक हियर व्हेन दीस टू नर्व्स यू नो एंड ऑफ कोर्स इट आल्सो इज कैरिंग यू नो इट्स एफरेंट फाइबर्स द स्पेशल गस्टेटिक गस्टेटिक फाइबर्स आल्सो फ्रॉम द हार्ट पैलेट ऑफ कोर्स एंड सॉफ्ट पैलेट दिस रीजन फॉर द गस्टेटिक फाइबर्स बी ऑफ द ग्रेट पेट्रोसल so both these nerves when they meet here you know this is the anterior wall of the lacerum foramen lacerum and into the anterior wall of the foramen lacerum in the pterygoid muscles there is a canal right and that canal anteriorly opens up into the pterygopalatine fossa so that's why this canal is called you know canal of pterygoid ter no, pterygoid canal this is called pterygoid canal so when the two nerves dot the petrosal and the greater petrosal when they meet they form the nerve of pterygoid canal the another nerve name another name for nerve of pterygoid canal is can anybody tell me what is the another name for yes neha it is virian nerve good so this is virian nerve and in the same canal you can find sometimes not always sometimes you can find that anterior the artery to pterygoid canal is a branch of internal carotid artery which also might enter into the and uh, pterygoid canal so 
they find the nerve, the median nerve and RG of pterygoid canal running into this pterygoid canal. Then what else you will find here, as I told you, there is a um, cartilage, of course, filling up the gap in the lacerum, foramen lacerum, then the meningeal branch from the ascending pharyngeal artery that enters to foramen mm, lacerum. This supplies blood into the uh, middle cranial fossa. And there was emissary vein, right? Emissary vein right above is cavernous sinus and just be below is pterygoid venous plexus. Remember little pterygoid, right? Little pterygoid is embedded in and out by this pterygoid venous plexus. And that's why yawning, yawning because to expel the deoxygenated blood in the pterygoid venous plexus, right? So that's why little pterygoid is also called the peripheral heart. Very good, Akash. So, here outside is little pterygoid and there is a plexus sounding and that's called pterygoid venous plexus. Communication is emissary veins. And you know that this is the wall-less, right? So, inside, outside, the direction of flow of blood is not exactly fixed all. To balance the intracranial pressure. Jitni bhi emissary veins hoti, they are wall-less. Okay, so we are moving further. Now we're talking about the meningeal branches supplying the posterior cranial fossa, right? The posterior cranial fossa, if you see, you know, let's say we are talking here is this foramina, jugular foramen, uh, jugular foramen. Take it. So if you're seeing this jugular foramen, the shape you can see is slightly, you know, elongated and it has a notch here, right? This notch here is actually called glossopharyngeal notch, right? The glossopharyngeal notch is my jugular foramen me, it is not completely broad. It has a depression or, or notch from one side, and that's gloss glossopharyngeal notch, which lodges the inferior ganglion of the glossopharyngeal now the ninth cranial nerve ki notch jo hai yaha pe they find is the inferior ganglion on the ninth cranial nerve right now talking about this uh, structures passing through you know this i have covering your viva and mcq portion so <clears throat> this is a big foramen right being big and an important one we study for the convenience into three parts you have an anterior portion of jugular foramen you have a middle portion of jugular foramen you have a posterior portion of the jugular foramen that's how you study so from you know you know in the anterior portion of the jugular foramen you will find inferior petrosal signs draining out through this Right? Inferior petrosal sinus, right? Ye kisko cavernous se communicate kar raha outside to the internal jugular. So this is inferior petrosal sinus. You'll find here running on the outside through this uh, anterior portion of the jugular foramen. And remember, there was this ascend uh, meningeal branch from the ascending pharyngeal artery. It was entering into the posterior cranial fossa through the anterior portion of the jugular foramen. Then the middle foramen, middle portion of the jugular foramen, you know, provides an ex exit for the 9th, 10th, and 11th cranial nerves, right? 9th, 10th, and 11th cranial nerves from the middle portion. Because, you know, 12th, kahan se aati, portion of the fossa mein hoti hai, but 12th emerges through the anterior condylar canal, the hypoglossal canal. So 9th and 11th pass out through the middle portion of jugular foramen. Then the posterior portion of the jugular foramen is wider, right? You can see it's broad and wide for the, you know, bulging of this sigmoid sinus. The bulb in the jugular vein, it is first of all bulged here. The sigmoid sinus terminates here into the posterior of the jugular foramen. And then there's this bulb of internal, internal jugular vein and which descends down in the form of internal jugular vein. And another thing that enters here is the meningeal branch of occipital artery on the posterior end of the jugular foramen. So the two meningeal arteries which enter the skull through this jugular foramen, one from occipital artery, posterior end, and entry end is the meningeal branch of ascending pharyngeal artery. Okay, so the two meningeal branches. Now can you think about the thing which I was talking before was a carotid sheath. 
if carotid sheath you know covers you know uh, the two main vessels is internal carotid in upper portion and internal jugular vein of course vagus that means this uh, care up till jugular foramen right because it's covering this internal jugular vein and vagus also and if it also is you know containing the internal carotid artery so that internal carotid artery is entering to the base of the petrous temporal and that's the carotid canal so that means carotid sheath when it ascends up into the base of the skull it covers the jugular foramen as well as the carotid canal internal carotid canal got it so when it will reach to the base of the skull obviously these are also there these three cranial nerves and of, right so these three cranial nerves and of course just you know just medial to there you find is anterior condylar canal also to 12th cranial nerve so these you know 9 11 and 12th cranial nerve they will also pass through the upper portion of the carotid sheath okay okay so we are done with the branches now uh, posterior cranial fossa you've got you've seen the two branches one from ascending pharyngeal and one meningeal branch from the occipital artery and the other artery was the vertebral artery supplying meningeal branches in the posterior cranial fossa so with that we'll just cover up this foramen magnum very important question in your viva exams as well as for mcq purposes so just have a look here this is <clears throat> uh somewhat oval foramen the jugular foramen is a uh, sorry foramen magnum is a true foramen somewhat elongated anteriorly making it an oval in shape right so let's about uh, talk about the structures you know that uh, spinal cord ascends up and joins and forms this foramen magnum oh, sorry medulla oblongata like upper limit of uh, spinal cord is said to be at the highest level of atlas vertebrae and what passes through the foramen magnum is the lower end of the medulla so you'll find that uh, of course it is covered by the meninges so you'll find the meninges you'll find is dura mater then you'll find is arachnoid mater and then the red color lining here it is the pia mater right so you can see here it is not spinal cord make sure sometimes if they ask in viva that what is that structure that passes through foramen magnum so you will not say spinal cord the better word is med lower part of medulla oblongata isliye i am just pointing it here again that the commencement of spinal cord it's all terminology like the difference in terminology because the lower end of medulla is structurally some similar to the upper end of the spinal cord so the terminology is like the spinal cord commences at the upper end of the atlas vertebrae remember that and reaches to the lower part of l1 vertebrae but what emerges through foramen magnum is the lower end of medulla oblongata got it so this is not spinal cord this is lower end of medulla oblongata one thing then in this you know there were 20 vertebrae surround surrounding the spinal cord right 20 vertebrae surround the spinal cord in adults seven cervical 12 thoracic and one lumbar thick that makes 20 vertebrae and in each of these vertebrae you find that one of the fold of one of the modifications of the pia mater is ligamentum denticulatum so the ligamentum denticulatum binds this you know spinal laterally to the walls of the vertebrae in each successive vertebrae so that makes 20 ligament pair of the ligamentum denticulatum in the vertebral canal and the first pair you will find at the margins of the foramen magnum so that makes 21 pair of ligamentum denticulatum so the first pair you find here is this to the lower portion of uh, medulla and it's binding to the little margin of foramen magnum so this is the first tooth of ligamentum denticulatum that's why you make it 21 pairs okay now look here kabhi kabhi detail mein puchne ko aaye diagrams ke sath aata hai question draw diagrams actually 
सो वन थिंग आई बिन टेलिंग ये तो इम्पोर्टेंट है पता ही है दैट यू नो एंटीरे लॉन्गिट्यूडनल फिशर इन द स्पाइनल कॉर्ड और इवन इन द मेडुला there is the single artery unpaired artery called the anterior spinal artery remember although it is unpaired but remember it supplies the anterior two third of the spinal cord right then there are two posterior spinal arteries which are paired along lying along the posterolateral sulcus right and these paired arteries they supply only the posterior one third of the spinal cord remember okay then there another artery entering here is this vertebral artery the fourth part of the vertebral artery right so the fourth part of the vertebral artery is one which emerges out of the foramen transverse cerium of atlas vertebrae i mean no sorry this one is the third part which in, uh, emerges from the foramen transverse cerium of the atlas it winds behind and curves around and then uh, you know there's a notch in the posterior lanto occipital membrane from where this is you know first cranial uh, first cervical now and this uh, because that gives meningeal nerves also for the, from the first cervical nerve so this first cervical nerve and the third part of vertebral artery it enters into the vertebral canal through the posterior uh, and through the notch or the gap in the posterior lateral occipital membrane so from there this, uh, this artery enters into the um, vertebral canal and ascends into the foramen magnum the important thing is that it lies anterior to the ligamentum denticulatum the important point is that the vertebral artery enters anterior to the ligamentum denticulatum and what lies behind to the ligamentum denticulatum is important that you remember that it's the spinal root of accessory now right 12th cranial now has two roots i'll taught i'll teach you and i'll be teaching you the 11th cranial now so this is the spinal root of accessory now which in you know which rather leaves here the skull or you can say you know actually it enters and then completely the two roots join and then emerge out and so this is the spinal root of accessory now which leaves the skull, uh, cranium posterior to the ligamentum denticulatum so this is the spinal root behind the ligamentum denticulatum right so you can remember all the structures here all these were you know covered by dura mater right so these were the structures in the subarachnoid space okay now what lies outside yani outside the dura extradural space anteriorly in the foramen magnum remember these are extensions of the ligaments from the atlanto occipital joints so atlanto axio vertebral atlanto axio occipital joint we together call it as like this you know atlas is come you know in between uh, rotating between axio occipital joint right? you know because this ligament from the apex of the dens that is the odontoid process of the axis that extends into the cranium anterior most is the apical ligament and this you know is supposed to be the extension of a remnant of rather a nucleus pulposus just like intervertebral discs you don't have an intervertebral disc between you know above to this because this is assumed to be the body of first cervical vertebrae that's called odontoid process so above to that it is an extension of notochord it is supposed and that is apical ligament which enters into the cranium the anterior most then you'll find you know there was this uh, transverse and a vertical branch the cruciate ligament right uh, cruciate ligament <coughs> you know the transverse band of the cruciate ligament ligament divides the uh, vertebral canal in the cavity or the vertebral canal of the atlas into two portion the anterior smaller portion the bigger wider portion for the uh, spinal cord and the anterior portion was divided for this uh, odontoid process and that makes the pivotal joint so <clears throat> this transverse process was a very having very important significance remember if this ligament breaks the transverse portion of the cruciate ligament breaks and that is instant then because this dentoid process compresses the vasomotor centers in the medulla lower medulla so that was one of the causes of death in hanging हाँ 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 सिमरन चलो अच्छी बात है यू रिमेम्बरिंग क्रूशियट लिगमेंट्स आर ऑफ कोर्स देर इन द 
नी ज्वाइंट इंट्रा आर्टिकुलर लिगमेंट होते हैं वेरी गुड बट टेल मी लाओ अभी बात आई है जो क्रूशियट लिगमेंट नी ज्वाइंट है इंट्रा आर्टिकुलर लिगमेंट वेरी वेल नोन फैक्ट can we tell me that the cruciate ligaments in the knee joint are there intrasynovial or extrasynovial very good that's extrasynovial yes okay ye extrasynovial ligaments hote hain ha to we are back here hum baat kar rahe the who will tell me like what is called the hangman's fracture hangman's fracture bataya tha maine well i was teaching these cervical joints hangman's fracture is hmm anybody yes fracture no 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 hangman's fracture is fracture of the pedicles of axis right if pedicles of axis get break so what happens this portion and you know the posterior neural arch of the axis will be pushed posteriorly and the anterior segment the body of axis which to which is the dense is attached this pushes posteriorly that becomes free right after the fracture of both the pedicles of atlas uh, pedicles of axis so fracture of pedicles of axis is called hangman's fracture okay judicial hanging me most common position of knot kya hoti hai in case of judicial hanging most commonly position of knot is side of the neck very good side of the neck is the most commonest position of judicial hanging and which is which position of the knot is a sure uh, which is a sh uh, you know sure uh, shot um, you know just chances of death you know full shot chances of death is when the knot is in sub mental position yes sub mental position mein there are 100% chances of death and sub occipital wala jo hota hai yani behind nape of the neck that you will find the knot is behind the neck in cases of suicidal hangings okay very good so ab ek ligament aur reh gaya hai ye dekho jo ye usi mein jo vertical portion hota hai cruciate ka that reaches into the mm, cranium right ek tarah se you can say this vertical band jo hota hai ट्रांसफर्स को तो वी हैव अंडरस्टूड वेरी वेल वो सेपरेट कर देता है के वर्टिकल कैनाल को टू फॉर्म अ पाइवर्टेड जॉइंट एंटीरियरली एंड नाउ टॉकिंग अबाउट द वर्टिकल बैंड वर्टिकल बैंड एक्चुअली इज यू नो होल्डिंग अप द एक्सेस वर्टिब्रे टू द ऑक्सीपिटल बोन राइट तो एक्सेस को ऑक्सीपिटल बोन से जोड़ के रखने के लिए यू हैव दिस वर्टिकल बैंड ऑफ क्रूशियट लिखा so that this axis gets interpressed between axis and occipital bone so this this vertical band of cruciate ligament also next structure and behind to them you will be finding is membrana tectoria membrana tectoria now this also if you know har cheez mein thoda thoda ye sab you know different type of mcqs being formed regarding like vestigial remnants modifications morphological significance and all so here let me tell you that you know uh, anterior longitudinal ligament right from the base of the skull it was reaching to the sacrum right so anterior longitudinal ligament jo in case of atlanto occipital join the anterior atlanto occipital membrane jo hoti hai that merges with uh, on the inner side of the anterior longitudinal ligament blends with it but here the posterior longitudinal ligament which runs on the anterior aspect of the vertebral canal binding all the vertebrae vertically right from the base of the skull reaching to the sacrum but in between here from axis because you know atlas doesn't has a body atlas vertebrae has no body so from the axis that is c2 to the skull that is you know the occipital bone from body of axis to the occipital bone posteriorly running this posterior longitudinal ligament is called membrana tectoria 
so it is an extension of posterior longitudinal ligament within the cranium and from c2 to occipital bone this portion is called membrana tectoria so remember these are the three uh, ligaments lying in extradural space and passing through the foramen magnum okay so you have understood about this okay now look have at the you know how it is there we taking a sagittal section of the cranial cavity do you find these are the different branches can you see this is the ascending pharyngeal artery right ascending pharyngeal artery so you find is this middle meningeal artery a foramen spinosum sinicularis and as as i told you there is this ascending anterior branch right ye terion ke andar jaati hai ye Uh, you know cranial vault ko puro ko supply kar rahi like you know this is the posterior division and as i told you this is the superior temporal line so the posterior division runs inside of the you know superior temporal line and reaches to this point this point is you know mastoid fontanel in a newborn in a nurse is called asterion right this point so it reaches to the posterior you know posterior division reaches and you can see the entire cranial wall from inside is supplied by the middle meningeal artery right the biggest coverage of the blood supply of meninges by middle meningeal artery then you have meningeal branch of occipital artery it enters into the skull through the posterior portion of the jugular foramen right then you have meningeal branch from ascending pharyngeal artery this enters into the skull through anterior condylar canal and posterior meningeal branch from the ascending pharyngeal artery this also enters into the skull through the anterior portion of jugular foramen then meningeal artery from vertebral artery i told you that vertebral foramen magnum enters before to that it gives its meningeal branches from vertebral artery right this also is there then ascending pharyngeal artery the near occipital ha yes look here the anterior marginal arteries anterior meningeal arteries from ethmoidal right anterior posterior ethmoidal they enter like you know from the orbit they enter into the roof of the nose or the lateral wall of the orbit or lateral wall of the nose and then they ascend up to the cribriform palate into the cranial into the cranium and these are the anterior and posterior ethmoidal arteries supplying blood to the floor of the anterior cranial fossa that is all and there you find is this cerebral artery aneurysms like you know in this is a you know you know uh some of the clinical aspects or applied portion which you find is that these arteries within the cranium because of increased hypertension with the age you find sometimes that there is ballooning of the tunica of the arteries the thinning of the tunica media which you know is the thickest layer in arteries sometimes that thinning of the tunica media leads to the ballooning or you know diverticulation of the artery and that is called aneurysms and then aneurysms can be different types they can be like you know fusty form or they can be you know you know just a lateral wall diverticulation type you means like the or sometimes berries aneurysm which is which is more common which is more common right in the um in the charcot artery i'll tell you these are the choroidal branches on middle meningeal artery uh, from the middle cerebral artery the choroidal branches they also have these uh, berries and neurisms so in cases of people having prolonged hypertensive uh, suddenly sometimes that can cause a cause of death or cause of paralytic uh, paralytic attack because of the perforation of the central branches of the cerebral arteries but here we talking about the meningeal artery right so in this diagram actually they've shown that the you uh, know after removing the brain you find <coughs> onto the floor there is this internal carotid right big artery and it's being dilated so this is a uh, aneurysm right this is aneurysm you find after removing the skull after removing the brain in the floor of the skull now this is an important point important clinical point <clears throat> there are also questions asked about uh, epidural and like intracranial hemorrhage ab dekhte hain ki ye kya hota hai dono mein differences bahut puche jate hain road side accident rt ho jata hai to obviously head injury hui helmet nahi hai agar to 
this is a very common type of injury in road traffic accidents especially when there is no helmet on and this can be cause of instant death or that can be cause of unconsciousness or sometimes lead to some clinical you know side effects like paralysis or abhi ho sakta it can lead to paralysis or can lead to permanent damage sometimes so what's the difference here you know epidural hemorrhage and subdural hemorrhage both are you know these spaces outside and inside the dura mater these spaces are potential spaces you know अच्छे से समझ लेना इसको बहुत क्वेश्चंस भी पूछते हैं इस पर डिफरेंसेस बिटवीन एक्स्ट्रा ड्यूरल एंड सब ड्यूरल हेमरेजेस सो इट इज वेरी ऑब्वियस लाइक यू नो इफ देयर इज अ ब्लीडिंग आउटसाइड द ड्यूरा राइट आउटसाइड द ड्यूरा मींस देयर इज द ब्लड कलेक्टेड बिकॉज़ ऑफ मेनिंजल वेसल्स रप्चर ऑफ मेनिंजल वेसल्स लीड टू एपिड्यूरल हेमरेज वन थिंग and subdural hemorrhage you, you know it's we're talking about the space between arachnoid and the meningeal layer of the dura and that's the subdural space right subdural also is a potential space now if you remember why why did we call the fourth layer of the skull as the dangerous layer of the skull the similar reason applies here in subdural hemorrhage because they were initially veins if you remember from the inside the cranium they were traversing the inner and outer tables then the you know perios pericranium then the loose areolar connective tissue then the glia panoretica then the subconnective uh, you know superficial fascia and then the skin like right? that's the layer of the skull from inside to out right so these you know in initially veins like connecting the veins of the skull to the dural vein sinuses they have a very much chances to you know break down in cases of scalp injuries in cases of scalp injuries the blood collected in the scalp in the you know is in the fourth layer and the reason if you remember because that loose space provides like you know uh, uh, you know easy space for slip sliding of the layers above and because this emissary veins are traversing that fourth layer they easily get ruptured one thing if you remember that fourth layer of the scalp is the dangerous layer of the scalp the same thing applies here now we talking about the subdural hemorrhage if you remember the thing about there is dura mater right dura mater has two layer outer and inner layer the meninges layer and in between the two layers is the dural vein sinus now the below to that meninges layer is arachnoid mater and arachnoid and dura have no uh, regular space right but arachnoid and pia has a lot of space and that is called subarachnoid space and of course that's filled with trabeculations and makes it a spongy space filled with csf having the cerebral vessels we are talking the space between dura and arachnoid which is normally obliterated and it's a potential space but the cerebral vessels if you remember the cerebral vessels also drain into the dural venous sinuses one thing then these arachnoid villi and granulations they also pour the csf or you can they, you know that's a drainage apparatus of cn uh, csf in the dural venous sinuses so what actually is traversing the subdural space it is the emissary veins it is the cerebral veins and it is the arachnoid villi and granulations okay so what traverses the subdu uh, subdural space are these mainly of course villi and granulations of course csf leak bhi ho jayega but talking about the blood here is the venous blood that leaks out because of the emissary and cerebral veins which traverse the subdural space got it so ab difference pe baat karte hain epidural and subdural mein understood now epidural mein think about meningeal middle meningeal artery remember kyunki vault mein you know most common side of fracture of skull is who will tell me most common side of fracture of skull is 
it is the parietal tuber the parietal eminence on both the sides don't confuse with nasal bone nasal nasal is the most commonest bone to fracture in skull remember the most common bone to fracture in skull is the nasal bones and most common site of fracture of skull is the parietal tuber or the parietal eminence on you know the parietal bones literally posteriorly so of course the cranial vault you can say if it fractures there is the you know in epidural hemorrhage there will be collection of arterial blood and that will be because of middle meningeal artery okay hemorrhage of middle cerebral artery yahan pe the blood deposited collected will be a venous blood and that you know is because of the emissary and cerebral vessels traversing the subdural space ye do important difference ho gaya blood kaun sa hota hai kisme okay then symptoms of cerebral compression are late here the symptoms of cerebral compression are early ye bhi yaad rakhna chahiye bada aasan si baat hai remember the two layers of the dura i told you the outer one is a thinner layer and is more vascular the endoscopic layer the inner one is more rigid more fibrous and less vascular understood because they form the folds of the dura mater तो ऑब्वियसली बात है इफ देर इज कलेक्शन ऑफ ब्लड आउटसाइड द ड्यूरा इट विल नॉट कंप्रेस ऑन द अंडरलाइंग स्ट्रक्चर्स इन द सेरेब्रल कॉर्टेक्स पे उसका प्रेशर इफेक्ट विल बी लेस बिकॉज़ अंडरलाइंग थिक रिजिड मेनिनजियल लेयर एंड इफ इट्स इट्स अ सबड्यूरल हेमरेज सबड्यूरल हेमरेज में द ब्लड क्लॉट इज एक्चुअली रेस्टिंग ऑन द अरेक्नोइड मैटर एंड दीस आर वेरी थिन लेयर्स सो द कंप्रेशन इफेक्ट जो आएगा सब ड्यूरल हेमरेज में अर्ली आएगा ठीक है द सिम्टम्स ऑफ सेबरल कंप्रेशन आर अर्ली इन सब ड्यूरल हेमरेज एंड सिम्टम्स ऑफ सेबरल कंप्रेशन विल बी लेट इन एपिड्यूरल ठीक है अब ये जो ब्लड है ओबियसली एक पॉइंट पे डजेंट सेटल्स एट वन पॉइंट रदर इट इज स्प्रेड्स abhi maine us din abhi abhi you know in the same lecture i was talking about how to evacuate that you know clotted blood by drilling a hole in this you know in case of middle meningeal artery for hemorrhage how to and where to drill those holes in case of anterior division of middle meningeal artery and in case of posterior division of the middle meningeal artery so kahin na kahin ye spread karega right jo clotted blood hai so isme kya ek aur point hai ki epidural hemorrhage mein paralysis first appears on the face and then spreads to the lower part of the body okay paralysis actually you know fir ye baat aagi epidural sheaths right the epidural sheaths that also extends on remember the three nerves i told you one two and three was uh, you know first one is olfactory optic and vestibular cochlea and remember that vestibular cochlear nerve enters the internal acoustic meatus does not enters alone but it enters along with the facial nerve and the labyrinthine artery the three structures they were entering the internal acoustic meatus along with the dural sheath the subarachnoid space around that so kahin na kahin epidural space mein the uh, you know you can remember that this uh, paralysis actually first appears on the face and then this uh, paralysis might extend to rest of the body here the paralysis ka koi hisab nahi hai anywhere like you know kyunki ye sab dural space mein hai right so it can spread anywhere and because compression effect is actually early hoga and the paralysis is haphazard theek then of course kyunki it is outside the, you know yahan pe CSF की कोई प्रॉब्लम ही नहीं आएगी नो ब्लड इन सी एस एफ बिकॉज इट्स आउटसाइड टू डूरा मैटर ब्लड यू नो हेमरेज इज आउटसाइड डूरा मैटर सो द ब्लड एंड सी एस एफ हैज नो मिक्सिंग सो इज नो ब्लड इन सी एस एफ बट यहाँ पे इफ यू रिमेंबर आई जस्ट टोल यू दैट सब ड्यूरल स्पेस इज ट्रेवर्स बाय इमिशरी वींस सेरबरल वींस and arachnoid villi and granulation simple si baat hai to yahan pe arachnoid villi and granulation mein agar tearing ho gayi to you know sab arachnoid leak ho jayega blood csf will be mixed with blood or blood will be mixed with csf simple so important hai that blood in csf is a common finding this is very important the differences between the two 
not only here but also in your clinical subjects also in your mcqs okay so there's a diagram there are actually three types of hemorrhages something you know you have epidural i have taught you subdural hemorrhage i have taught you and there can be a hemorrhage in the subarachnoid space like below between arachnoid and pia mater and that is a space you can see is uh, you know filled with csf and has cerebral vessels look here first of all ye wala dekhte hain now this one is an extra dural hemorrhage extra dural hemorrhage mein you can see this is the cranial vault fracture ho gaya right there's a fracture can you see a vessel underneath that this is a meningeal vessel which has been torn so if a meningeal vessel ruptures there will be collection of arterial blood in the epidural space and that is called <coughs> epidural hemorrhage one thing now here in this diagram you are seeing is a subdural hematoma now subdural hematoma you remember now this here look look at the thing this is a pink color color lining and outside is the endostyle of the dura this is the meningeal layer of the dura this is fox cerebri right then you find underneath is arachnoid matter the red color thing and this is the pia mater this is the subarachnoid space filled with trabeculations now in them in the subarachnoid space there was cerebral artery and veins running in the subarachnoid space so this is a cerebral vein running in the subarachnoid space and as i told you that cerebral vessels will perforate the meningeal layer of the dura to reach to drain into the subarachnoid or uh, so in, so into the dural vein sinuses so the subdural space is traversed by the cerebral vessels to drain into the dural vein sinus meningeal layer ko pierce karega tabhi to drain hoga na usme dural vein sinus so cerebral veins yahan pe emissary vein upar emissary veins bhi hoti hain to cerebral veins perforate karte hain to fir obviously agar yahan pe hemorrhage we can see that the cerebral vein get ruptures so the blood color deposited in the subarachnoid space will be venous blood in case of subarachnoid hemorrhage so sorry in case of subdural hemorrhage now we talking about subarachnoid hemorrhage subarachnoid mein kya hoga imagine if there is a bleeding now this bleed may not be due to trauma only because if there is a trauma there are very much chances ki pehle you know there are chances of epidural or subdural hematoma so this type of hemorrhage may not be due to a trauma or rather can be because of high blood pressure right chronically high blood pressure right jise kehte hain cerebral hemorrhage you know sudden hemorrhage ki wajah se aur dusra reason ye ho sakta hai ki in increased ha dusra was i told you abhi just that kind be a case of aneurysm if the cerebral artery might be thinned out somewhere in its walls so then it cannot sustain the increase in intracranial pressure then might be a rupture of a vessel so subarachnoid bleeds might not be due to trauma rather from uh, you know hypertension or be due to aneurysms so they you find is a cerebral artery perfusion you know perf you know that's a leakage or you can see hemorrhage rupture of a cerebral artery will lead to collection of blood where in the subarachnoid space and what does it means it means that csf is completely filled with blood the subarachnoid space instead of CSF, i mean the csf in the subarachnoid space gets mixed with blood you can see the other side here it is normal right and it becomes dilated one thing subarachnoid space will be become will become and we get with that so in the fourth we remember the comparison between epidural and subdural there was a last point regarding csf and blood so in case of do uh, epidural blood will not be found in csf but in case of subdural there are chances of blood to be found in csf but in case of subarachnoid space there is a must it's must that the blood will be seen in the csf ye teeno mein differences pata chal gaye you got to know the differences between the three different hemorrhages i think uh enough for today
we'll continue with another topic after lunch right so be there on time at 2 pm we'll again start